Do you want to find a wonderful Catholic husband or wife? If you're watching this video, the answer is probably yes. So in this video, I'm going to lay out the principles of Catholic dating that no one is talking about that we seem to just have forgotten in this modern age. Nowadays, Catholics are dating just like secular people, and that is a problem. So I'm going to lay out in this video the principles that you need to follow as a Catholic who is either looking to ask somebody out on a date, already dating, engaged, or just about to be married. We're going to walk through step by step what dating is, what dating is for, and how to go about it. So we can remove all of that confusion that you've been feeling, and you can know exactly what the steps are to ask a girl out, go on a date, and hopefully maybe one day get married. Because Our Lady of Fatima told us that the final battle between God and the kingdom of Satan is over marriage and the family. And if we want to win the family, we have to start by dating and dating chastely and dating in a way that's pleasing to our Lord and Our Lady. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Because once you understand these principles, you're going to have so much light and clarity that a lot of the awkwardness that you feel in dating, a lot of the the anxiety that you feel about dating is just going to evaporate and you're going to know exactly what your next step is. So let's go ahead and jump into principle number one. So the first thing I want to talk about is a mistake that almost everybody makes at some point. They get this idea that if I just had a spouse, then I would be happy. If I just had a spouse, then I would be close to God and then I would love him and be able to become the saint that God wants me to be. That's not how it works at all. St. John of the Cross was once written a letter by a woman who he was spiritual directing. This woman was a sister, and so she was in a convent. And she wrote to St. John, and she said, Oh, all my sisters, they're so annoying. And they keep tapping their feet while we're trying to pray, and they keep playing with their thumbs while we're trying to pray, and it's so, so distracting. If only my sisters weren't like that, and if only my sisters weren't so annoying, then I would be able to become a great saint. And St. John of the Cross, being the saint that he is, writes back and says, No, sister, those annoyances that you're experiencing, that's how God is trying to make you a saint. Those annoyances are the cause of, and not a hindrance to, your sanctification. So whenever we're in dating, and we're looking to find a spouse, and we're looking to get married, and we just want to start our lives with the other person, If we feel like we're getting rejected or we feel like we're awkward or we feel like we can't find the right person at the right time and we feel all of that, that's not God saying, no, I don't want you to be a saint. That's God saying, yes, I want you to be a saint, but you have to come to me on my terms. You don't get to decide everything, not if you want to be a saint. You have to submit to my will for you and you have to submit to my timing and to my plan. So whenever we're dating, we need to keep in mind that surrender is the foundation of your dating life. You have to surrender what happens, when it happens, how it happens. You have to surrender all of that to God. My wife, before I had met her, several times had to go into a chapel and just cry because God had put on her heart a strong, strong desire for marriage and a family. Ever since she was five years old, she had that desire to be a wife and one day, God willing, a mother. And she kept going through college and then graduating and working and going on dates and just nothing was working. And so she had this longing on her heart, this desire. And it looks like my two-year-old daughter has just busted into the studio. (laughs) You want to say hi to the camera real quick? Come here. There's the camera. There's the camera. Say hi, Celine. Hi. Hi. Can you blow a kiss? Okay. Go back with mommy now. Maybe that'll be a bonus footage. Proof that this dating advice works is there was my two-year-old daughter who just busted into my studio. One of the perks of working from home. (laughs) So like I was saying, what was I saying? Foundation of your dating life and even your married life has to be surrender to God's will. You have to give him everything and relinquish control over everything, all of the circumstances to him. Like my wife did whenever she would go into the chapel and cry and say, Lord, I want a husband more than anything in the world, but I want what you want even more than that. And she surrendered that to God. And that's why she was able to become my wife very quickly. We only dated for six weeks before we got engaged. Okay, so principle number one is you have to surrender your marriage and your dating life to God entirely. And you have to say, Lord, I want to be married, but I want what you want even more than that. And I'm willing to sacrifice even my deepest desires to you 
if that be your will. You have to be like Abraham, who is willing to sacrifice Isaac, his only son, who he loved. Once you have that disposition, you're ready. And once you have that disposition where you're willing to surrender your deepest desires to God, that's whenever God really is able to fulfill the deepest longings of your heart and to do it well. Okay, so the point is, is that your marriage is for the sake of bringing you closer to God. Your spouse is your vehicle to God. And if you're being selfish about it, and if you're wanting marriage for your own sake and not wanting marriage for God's sake, then you're doing it wrong and you might not be ready. So listen, if you want to have an infinite amount of confidence, not just the self-help guru kind of girl pickup culture confidence that's fake and shallow and surface level, but if you want to have real confidence when you're talking to women or when you're talking to people of the opposite gender you might be attracted to, what you have to have is called holy indifference. What holy indifference is, is it's where you have detached yourself from everything that you might want if it's not pleasing to God. So what does that mean? Somebody with holy indifference could look at a situation and say, if the Lord gives me health, blessed be God. And if the Lord gives me sickness, blessed be God. If the Lord wants me to live another 70 years to a ripe old age and then die, blessed be God. And if the Lord wants to take my life tomorrow, blessed be God. Holy indifference is where you've completely surrendered and you have become a saint in a certain sense. And you look at all the situations around you and you trust in God's providence that he's going to bring about what's best for you. And you say, Lord, if you want to keep me single for the rest of my life, blessed be God, I surrender that to you. And Lord, if you want to get me married and you want me to have kids and you want me to meet my spouse tomorrow, then blessed be God. I am fine with whatever happens so long as it is your will and not mine. That's holy indifference. And if you have that, then the next time you go up to speak to a person who you think is attractive, you're going to have an invincible, an invincible confidence, an amount of confidence that can't be overcome by anything in the world. Why? Because when you go up to talk to the woman, you're not going to be thinking, oh, I have to do this. or I have to. You're submitted totally to God's will and you love God's will more than you love your own will. So if things go well, blessed be God. That's what we wanted. And if things don't go well, blessed be God. That's what we wanted. So you don't have to worry so much, but you have to get there first. You have to attain holy indifference. Whatever God gives, you receive and you receive with thanksgiving. That's point number one. And point number two, this is a mistake that everybody in the Catholic dating sphere makes at some point. This is what the secular culture teaches us about dating. It is not what Jesus teaches us about dating and marriage. What the secular culture tells us and what most people believe in some way or another is that dating is about getting the girl or dating is about getting something out of the other person. You get pleasure, you get enjoyment of their company, you get nice things from them. You get, you get, you get, you get, you get. That's what the culture tells you dating is for. It's a consumptive mindset. I date because of what I get out of it. If you're dating in that way, you're going to get divorced. Why? Because eventually the other person won't be able to read your mind and to please you the way that you want. Eventually the other person is going to become just another person. And that honeymoon phase is going to wear off. There's a book called The Brain That Changes Itself. And in that book, this doctor of neurology makes the point that whenever somebody is falling in love, the chemicals in their brain shifts. Their brain chemistry shifts so that not only the other person who they love seems enjoyable and lovely and pleasant, but that effect kind of overflows into everything around them. So whenever somebody's falling in love, food will taste better. Sunsets will look more beautiful and more vibrant. The entire world is almost reborn in your eyes because of the chemicals that are floating around in your brain when you fall in love. And that's why this secular mindset of dating works for the first month, year, two years, maybe three years, because whenever that person's still new and novel and you love them, then everything seems good. But eventually that wears off and you're forced to face reality again. And at that point, you're going to realize this person isn't pleasing me. I'm not in love with them anymore. I need to go find somebody else who I can be in love with so that chemical cocktail can start in their brain again. It's all selfish. It's all about me and what I get out of the relationship. This is what you have to do if you want to avoid that mistake. You have to shift your perspective on dating so that it's about what you can give away and not what you can take. Jesus says, the greatest amongst you shall be the servant of all. If you want to be a good spouse, you have to serve your spouse. You have to give away your talents, your time, even your body. 
motherhood is a real, real cross for women. It's beautiful and it's wonderful, but there are sleepless nights. You give up so much of your liberty. For nine months, you're not able to do a lot of the things you might enjoy because you're carrying around another human being inside of you. And it's wonderful and it's great and it's beautiful for women to have that cross and to carry it well, but it's still a cross and it's still very difficult. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And in marriage, that's what you have to do. You have to be willing to lay down your life totally for your spouse with the caveat that you expect nothing in return. It has to be an unconditional love, a love that gives away totally and selflessly. Because Ephesians 5 tells us that men have to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church and loved every single human being on the earth to the extent that he was willing to die for them. That's what marriage is about. You lay down your life for your spouse. So shift your mindset and stop thinking about what can I get out of dating and start thinking about how can I best serve the other person? This is how you're going to find purpose in your life. This is how you're going to be able to overcome the secular mindset that just frankly sucks and leaves everyone dissatisfied and alone and empty. This is how you're going to do it. How can I serve? How can I give instead of focusing on what can I take and how can I receive? Point number three, which ties into point number two, is in order to be attractive to people of the opposite gender, you have to provide what the other person is looking for. So what are Catholic women looking for? Well, I have a wife now, and I have sisters and sister-in-law, and I know what good Catholic women are looking for. They're looking for a virtuous man who can carry himself well and provide for her and the children. They're looking for a virtuous man who carries themselves well, who can provide. That's what good Catholic women are looking for. There's probably bad Catholic women out there who are looking for something else, but the good ones I know are looking for a virtuous man who carries themselves well, who can provide for them and their families, can provide spiritually and materially. So if you want to go on dates with Catholic women and you want to try to attract them so that you can find your spouse, find your vocation, and start your life as a married man, you have to learn how to be virtuous. What does that mean? Well, if you are struggling with an addiction to filth on the internet, which I work with tons of young men, I know it's a problem that everyone has. If you're struggling with that, you're not alone. You're probably in the majority, but you gotta get that fixed. You gotta get that straight before you're ready to date. You have to, there's no other way around it. There's no other way. In order for you to be able to provide spiritually for a woman, you have to first be able to provide spiritually for yourself, which means no mortal sin. You need to be free from mortal sin before you start dating for a bare minimum, bare minimum of six to eight weeks. I probably think it should be longer than that, but a bare, bare minimum of six to eight weeks before you're ready to start engaging romantically with a woman in a way that's pure and chaste and not going to lead both of you into sin and ultimately to hell. So be a man of virtue. Eliminate 100% of the mortal sins in your life. Go to mass frequently. Go to confession frequently. You cannot have mortal sin and be ready to date. You cannot do it. You have to be in a state of grace to date well. Next, you have to learn to carry yourself well. You could be a very virtuous man, but if you don't have the virtue of modesty, which I'm going to tell you what that is in just a second, if you don't have the virtue of modesty, women aren't going to look at you. Why? Modesty is the virtue whereby a person comports themselves in a fitting way for the situation. It means that they dress the way that they're supposed to dress, they talk the way that they're supposed to talk, they smile the way they're supposed to smile, they regulate their exteriors according to the environment. So a modest man doesn't just mean that he's wearing sleeves or that he has shorts that are long enough or something like that. A modest man is somebody who looks sharp. A modest man is somebody who looks respectable in social situations. A modest man is somebody who stands up with their shoulders back whenever they're in public because that indicates that they're ready and they're alert and they're behaving in a way where they, they're showing that they care about what other people think, which is an act of charity. So you have to learn to carry yourself well. So do you need a haircut? Do you need to shave? Do you have nasty little stubblies on your chin that just need to go? Do you need a new outfit? Do you need a new wardrobe? Is your shirt wrinkly? When's the last time you brushed your teeth and combed your hair? These are all things that aren't vain. They're not vanity metrics. What they are, are they're parts of the virtue of modesty. If you're going to go hang out with somebody who you think is attractive and who you may want to ask on a date, 
it's important that you reflect the fact that you think they're important by treating yourself well. Because other people, like it or not, they have to look at you. It's their job to look at you some of the time. And so you want to lubricate that social situation by making yourself look presentable, right? If somebody were giving a lecture as a professor in a college and they were wearing shorts and a t-shirt, nobody would listen to them. If they dress nicely and they wear a suit and a tie or something like this, then they're going to be listened to much more easily. So you need to get down the virtue of modesty. You need to be a virtuous man who carries himself well and can provide for a woman and her children. What does that mean? It means that you have to be able to provide spiritually and physically. How do you provide spiritually? You lead the family in the rosary every day. If you're dating, lead your fiance, lead your girlfriend in the rosary every time that you hang out with her. Make that a priority. That's the easiest way to tell if you're leading spiritually or not. If you pray the rosary daily with your bride, you're leading your family spiritually. You are. That's the bare minimum. You can do that and that's it. And you'll know that you're checking the box and getting enough done. Secondly is, can you provide materially? Just be honest. Can you? Do you have a job where you're making enough money where, yes, it may be tight. You may have to live very frugally for the first few years of marriage. I think that's good for married people, honestly. But can you provide enough so that everyone can eat, everyone can be taken care of, everyone can have a roof over their heads? Can you provide the bare minimum? If yes, then you are probably in a state where you can start asking women who you find attractive and who you think might be compatible with you and who are virtuous on dates. If no, get that fixed first. You have to be free from mortal sin and be able to provide for a woman and a family materially and spiritually. And on the material level, enough to get by is enough. You don't need to be making $600,000 a year to provide for a wife and family, but you need to be making enough to afford the necessities of life. Okay, next I want to talk about trust in Providence. One of my friends who's a historian tells a story all the time about how George Washington's coat, according to one of his soldiers, George Washington's coat was always riddled with bullet holes, but for whatever reason, the bullets missed him. Does that sound like any president <laughs> that we know today? Well, listen, the way it works is that God's providence ordains everything. God is in charge of everything, what happens when it happens. So whenever we are dating, we need to keep in mind that we are not outside of God's plan. And even if we've sinned, and even if we've sinned mortally and we've fallen, we are still not outside of God's plan. And we need to put our trust in God's providence. He is going to lead you to your future spouse on his time, in his circumstances, the way that he wants it to be done. He will do that. So take the pressure off of yourself and stop thinking this sort of self-loathing mentality where, oh, if I had only done this, or oh, if I had only done this. Listen, that's from the devil. God wants you to forget about the sins of your past and move on in his mercy. Now, that doesn't mean act however you want. That doesn't mean that you're free from sin and you don't need to do penance or anything like this. But remember that God loves you. And if you turn your heart totally towards God, he will turn his heart totally towards you and forget about the sins of your past. St. Catherine of Siena says that if any sinner repents perfectly, God forgets about all of the sins of their past and treats them as if they had never sinned. So repent of your past life and recognize that your sins are your fault and that you don't, you cannot repeat them in the future. And then trust in God's providence to lead you anyway, even though you may have fallen and fallen grievously. There is hope. There is so much hope. There is hope for all of you out there. Remember that. Remember that hope comes from God and peace comes from God and pursue that. All right. So now let's get straight on to the practical stuff. These are the things that people ask all the time and nobody wants to give a straightforward answer to. So I'm just going to answer it. I'm going to answer it bluntly and you can take it how you like. So the question is, how far is too far whenever you're dating somebody? Listen, first of all, that's the wrong question to ask. How far is too far is how much can I get away with before it's sinful? <laughs> that's not the question that you want your future spouse to be asking about you. What you want your future spouse to be asking is, how can I best honor you? How can I best love you and take you to heaven? That's what you want your future spouse to be asking. But for the sake of practicality, how far is too far? Well, if you are just dating somebody and you're on a first date or a second date, you need to be careful not to do physical things that are going to emotionally set you up for failure. If you're on your first date, you don't need to be holding hands or putting your arm around the other person or anything like that. Why? Because whenever you have physical contact with somebody, it releases a hormone called oxytocin. 
and oxytocin is a bonding hormone. Whenever mothers have a baby and then they hold the baby for the first time, there is a huge, huge release of oxytocin that bonds the mother to the child. And the same chemical is released whenever somebody is holding hands or cuddling or a long hug. Things like this release oxytocin and they start to bond the two people together psychologically. So what you're doing is on a first date, if you're engaging in those activities, you are starting to create a bond that doesn't need to be there yet. Because those bonds are very difficult to break and a first date is not difficult to break. You could break it off at any point. So you need to make sure that your psychological and physical attachments fit the type of relationship that you're in. If you are betrothed and you are married, well, there's different types of physical expressions that are appropriate for that situation because a more permanent bond like that can be formed between a couple that is betrothed and a, the most permanent bond can be formed between a couple that is married. So if you're just on a first date with somebody, don't hold hands. Don't put your arm around them. Go to a public place and just converse with them and figure out if they are virtuous enough for you to continue to date and if they are somebody that you have any chemistry with at all. There are certain types of affection that aren't necessarily bonding in this way. For example, a kiss on the cheek or something like that could be a perfectly legitimate expression of affection for a couple that is betrothed. There are certain things that are just ordered towards the marital act. And those things need to be avoided until the marital act can be sinlessly engaged in. And if you want to know what a pope says about this, Pope Alexander VII says, A kiss is not merely a venial sin when performed for the sake of the carnal and sensible delight which arises from the kiss, even if the danger of further consent and pollution is excluded. What does that mean? It means that making out is not a venial sin. If you're dating somebody, if you're engaged to somebody, making out is not a venial sin. Why? Because making out is ordered towards the marital act. The end of making out is the marital act. And so if somebody's engaging in something that leads to the marital act, when they're not allowed to engage in the marital act without sin, then that is disordered and it's sinful. And Pope Alexander VII says it's not merely a venial sin. So be very chaste and Basically, just treat the woman like your grandmother is in the room with you at all times. <laughs> and that should be a good rule of thumb. Because men have to be able to protect and to provide for the woman. And the number one thing that you have to protect a woman from is yourself, your own lust and your own desires. You have to protect them from yourself. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to protect them from anybody else. Okay, next question I get all the time is, how do I ask a girl out without being awkward and without looking like a creep? The first thing is dating is intrinsically a little bit awkward in the way that it is today. And the way that it's always been is always been a little bit awkward. But the men who get the girl that they want, they don't let that awkwardness define them. They realize it's there and then they behave reasonably anyway. So if you want to ask a girl out without feeling silly, this is what you do. You remember that she's a normal human being and you're a normal human being and you're having a normal human interaction. If you put all the pressure on yourself and think, oh, I just have to impress her. I have to be so suave and so cool. No, you're just going to end up flopping because nobody's actually as cool as they look. Nobody's actually as suave as they look. We all have problems. We all have personal lives. We all have faults. We all have mistakes. You're a human being. She's a human being. I'm a human being. Nobody's perfect. Remember that and then go and have a normal conversation with this woman. And don't try to force anything into the situation if it's not there. A lot of times people can get this idea of, oh, I have to ask her out right now or otherwise I'll never get a chance again. Listen, if God wants you to be married to that person, he's going to make it happen. Remember that holy indifference. Even before you go into the conversation with her, say a prayer and say, Lord, I surrender this conversation to you. Do with it as you will. Thy will be done and not mine. And then walk into the conversation. And if God wants that conversation to go well and lead somewhere, it will, and he'll make sure that it does, and he will send his angels to inspire the thoughts of the things you're supposed to talk about with this woman, and he'll make sure that they're received well. He'll take care of everything because God ultimately is the God of conversation as well, and God governs how people interact in conversation and what they talk about. God's in charge of everything. He's in charge of all of that. So surrender that to God, go into the conversation, and see how it goes. And if it doesn't go well, blessed be God. And if it does go well, blessed be God. This is what you do, though, if you actually want to make a move and ask a girl out. It doesn't have to be very complicated. 
And the last thing I'll say, this is an elephant in the room for a lot of people, but it needs to be said, and I'm specifically addressing this to young men. Women, you can listen in. You might get something out of this as well. But this one is specifically for the men. Listen, St. John Bosco says that the number one killer of vocations is gluttony. You need to, if you're going to be a chaste husband, you need to discipline your body. You need to be chaste and temperate as regards your desires for both food and for pleasure. So whenever you are trying to get ready to be a husband, you need to have some sort of fasting in your life, some sort of self-denial. One of the reasons that women don't find overweight men attractive, and I'm speaking to men here, and I'm not speaking down to anybody. If somebody struggles with this, I do too, and I'm a human being, and I have some strategies that I've used that help me tremendously. But listen, if you are struggling with being overweight as a man, that's an indication that you may need to get your physical desires in check. And you don't need to be six-pack jack. You don't need to be some sort of ridiculously shredded person, but you do need to have good enough control of your desire for food in order to have good enough control for your desire for sexual pleasure. The two go hand in hand. So if you want to prepare yourself for marriage as a man and you want to be chaste and honest and good, you need to start disciplining your body as regards food. You need to start fasting in some way. And this is the key. And if you do this, this is how I in the past have lost 20 pounds very quickly. This is how I lose weight during Lent. Not that I'm trying to do my sacrifices for the sake of losing weight, but you get the idea. This is what I do in order to stay lean and in order to keep my desire for food under control. And if you can make this one mentality shift, it's incredibly powerful and it's going to be something that you can use for the rest of your life. What you do is you have to learn to love hunger. Stop viewing hunger as something bad, as the enemy, and stop viewing hunger as a means to an end. But if you can shift your mentality and whenever you feel hungry, thank the hunger, love the hunger, embrace the hunger, and recognize that the hunger is leading you to your goals. If you can do that and feel feel the hunger working for you and not against you and feel good as a hungry person, then you're never going to struggle with weight again or you're going to be able to keep the weight off or get it off. Because oftentimes we get this idea that whenever hunger comes, it's something to be avoided. There's something we have to take care of. We need to eat or we need to run away from that. We need to distract ourselves. If you can just embrace that cross and love that cross of hunger, then your fasting is going to start to feel good. And you're going to notice that the weight just kind of flies off of you in a way that's actually fun and enjoyable. So if you're a man, especially, and you're listening to this, you need to be temperate before you can get married. You need to control your desires for food and your desires for sex. Otherwise, you are not ready to get married. If you can't control one, you probably can't control the other. So you need to be very, very focused and intentional about this. And as a byproduct, you may end up losing some weight and looking great, which doesn't hurt. So get temperates under control, get your desire for food under control, and you'll notice that your desire for sexual pleasure comes along for the ride. If you start fasting, then your desire to watch filth on the internet will decrease. It's just a natural consequence. And then the next thing is the reason that women are attracted to men who have muscles is because it's hard to put on muscle. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of pain and suffering. So men that are able to actually do that, it's an indication that they have the virtue of fortitude. So before you can get married as a woman, you really need the virtue of temperance. You need to be very chaste and very temperate. Same thing for a man. But additionally, for men, you have to be very fortitudinous. You have to have a lot of courage and strength. So one of the reasons that psychologically women are attracted to men with muscles is because it's hard to grow muscles. And if a man has muscles, it's an indication that he has put some hard work into his body and he has disciplined his body. So the women, without even knowing it, are thinking, oh, he is disciplined in his body. He's not fat, so he's not overeating, so he's temperate. And he's strong, he has muscles, so he has fortitude. And that is the virtues that your body is signaling to another person whenever you are dating. Look, this is not vanity. This is not any of that. This is just human biology and human psychology. God made us this way, and now we have a fallen human nature that we have to combat against. But we can spend all of our time complaining Oh, human nature shouldn't be that way. We should all be saints. We should judge what's on the inside. Yes, 100% true. I agree. But we can't just spend our time complaining about how things should be. We have to interact with how things actually are. 
And as a man, your ability to go on dates with women and to find the woman of your dreams in large part may be dictated by how well you can present yourself physically, how well you can present yourself in your dress, how well you can present yourself in your speech. All of that matters. All of that matters. What's on your heart matters the most, but you have to be able to communicate that well. Otherwise, you'll never get a shot. So play, pay attention. Really focus on what natural virtues are you lacking. Do you lack temperance? Fix that, and probably a woman will just appear in your life. God works that way sometimes. Do you lack fortitude? Fix that, and then maybe a woman will appear in your life. Do you lack charity or faith? Are you committing X, Y, or Z mortal sin? Fix that, and then once you're ready for a spouse, God will send them. So the point of all of this is keep hope. Always keep hope. Our God is a God of hope. Our God is a God of encouragement and strength. Whatever goals you have, whatever desires you have, they can and will be fulfilled in Christ Jesus our Lord. Keep going in the right direction. Do not be discouraged and do not lose hope because those emotions are not from God. God wants your happiness even more than you do, and he wants to help you to attain it. So help him out by just covering these natural bases, these natural foundations, so that he can send you the man or the woman of your dreams and you can have a good and holy Catholic family. For anyone who's watching this all the way to the end, the free resource that I promised is a St. Raphael Novena. It is the Novena that my wife finished the day before she met me. St. Raphael is the patron saint of happy meetings, and it works. So give it a try. And if you want to join me and a group of other men in praying the rosary daily and praying for our future spouses and praying that we become the men that God has made us to be, then join my Discord community and check out the link in the description.